Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests waiting to be profiled are Milton Katsalis and director L. Lane, Zane. I got it confused, L. Zane. We have a multi-hyphenate in Milton Katsalis, a director, teacher, painter, architect, and writer. He was born and raised in Pittsburgh, the son of Greek immigrants. After graduating from Carnegie Mellon Institute, he went on to New York. You know, Andy Warhol also went to Can Carnegie Mellon. I guess after you, Milton. Yeah, he, was, right? he went with my brother. He was at school with my brother. Oh, he did? Yes. <laughs> so after Carnegie Mellon, um, Milton went to New York to apprentice with Elia Kazan, Lee Strasberg, and Josh Logan. You must have learned a lot from them. Uh, as a young student coming out. And did you apply those things when you started teaching class or when you started acting? Absolutely. It was a great benefit to be an apprentice, which I picked up from my father and that European sense of uh, study that apprentice was an important thing. To, to, to actually be on the job working. Yes, but how did him. you get those? How did you get to be with those such big names? I just saw Kazan in the street and ran up and talked to him and spoke Greek to him and oh. he said when I got out of school I should see him and I did and Josh I wrote him a letter and he said I should come and see him and but, got a job. But Josh was more the musical side yes, would you but say? Yes he was directing a play by James Leo Hurley and I assisted him. Oh during that and then yeah. Strasburg? He was teaching and I applied and got into his class and studied with him as a student for a couple of years. And then did you go right into acting or did you go into directing? I was acting and directing both and I was I became a member of the uh, director's unit of the actor's studio. Oh you did? Yes. The director's unit? Yes. Oh I see. So did you want to give, give up acting? Uh, pretty quick. Did you? you Why? Know, because I wanted to design and work with designers and lighting and costumes Right from the beginning, right from college. I did my thesis on Anton Chekhov on the Cherry Orchard, and I wanted to be a director. Oh, you wanted to do that? Yeah. So then how did the teaching part come? Did you come well, to L.A., or did you teach in New York? Or? Well, it's very funny. I started teaching even in college. They didn't know it, but because I visited New York, when I was in college, I came back and secretly I was teaching in college. Oh, you <laughs> Yes, but then, <laughs> yeah. But that was a very artsy atmosphere, wasn't it, at Carnegie Mellon? Yes, very much so. And then when I graduated, I started teaching. Right away? Right away. And then did you, you were teaching in New York, I guess? Teaching in New York. One of my students was Gary Smith, the producer. I know yeah, Gary yeah. very well. Is He's, that right? Yes, he was one of my first students. So you taught him how to direct these great... No, not really, <laughs> not really. Because he does all those uh, audience participation shows and... and um, Big musical productions, right. Liz, you know, he did Liz and all that stuff. He did, did do a lot of those. Also the yes. um, uh, award shows, yes. didn't he? Yeah, very good. Dwight Hemian and he, yeah. Uh, so when you came to Los Angeles, you were teaching a, a lot of actors, renowned actors. Yes, uh, I came and I directed a play here that uh, starred Henry Fonda, and then I got from that my first movie, Butterflies Are Free, as a director, and, and I began to direct films here and teach here, and that's when I started painting, actually, in California. But I was teaching, uh, teaching and painting in New York as well. Yes. But you have a Beverly Hills Playhouse. Yes. Do you use that for your students or does anyone use it? Yes. Well, it's part of the Camelot, which is a non-profit organization. Ah. We do plays. 
and then I teach at the Beverly Hills Playhouse. I see. But, and some of the young actors that you had, I know Michelle Pfeiffer was one of your students. Yes, many. George Clooney and Tom Selleck and many of them. They just sit in class and, and absorb what you have to teach? Yes, they did for years and then Did you get them on, on stage or did you get them in film right away? No, on stage and then oh. they went on and did series and television and movies and whatever. What would you say is uh, more important, stage or getting on film? Well, I think if you check it out, most of the great movie and television actors worked on the stage first, whether they're Pacino or De Niro, Redgrave, Fonda, they all worked on the stage, got their training, grounded themselves, and then went on. Why is that? Because they have to learn their lines well, and remember them every night? Or? There's that, but there's also the sense that once you do a play, you get that full rounded pie, so to speak, oh, it's the whole finished. thing. And then when you put it all together, you're able to go in and take it apart because when you make a movie, you then take it in pieces. But knowing how to do the whole thing, you then are able to take it apart in pieces, and yet you know how those pieces fit together as a whole. I think that brings us to your painting, painting <laughs> doesn't yes. it? That's yes. very good. Because when you actually started painting uh, really seriously, it was because of some competition. That yes, you were in. there was an Emily Lowe competition that she did in New York, and this was in the mid '60s. Um. And I was just started painting, and like six or eight months later, I entered this competition, and there were like nine thousand painters, and I happened to win, which lost me a lot of my uh, painter friends who were sort of angry <laughs> that I'd won. You know, who'd been working that's only right, at for that. Years. <laughs> that's right, and you know it continued up to present time and the painting that you see here and this exhibition which we're going to do in October is an outcome of that work which started way back in the 60s. But <clears throat> does the stage give you the energy for your painting or does the painting give you the energy to direct? I think it's an interchange of both works influence me and one does the other and you know stage work and stage craft and working with a lot of great designers I worked initially oh. with Boris Aronson who was a great painter and a great set designer influenced me somebody saw me the other day who saw my paintings and said who was your teacher it was a Russian guy and I said well one of my teachers was Boris Aronson because it he does said, have a Russian uh, uh, um, a constructivist kind of, a feel. kind of touch uh -huh. yes but also it has movement you can see all the movement coming yes. through this and yes. I think that's I was thinking when I saw the work that you direct and you move people around the stage you move your paints around well, the canvas it's kinesi you know the Greek word is kinesi kinesis movement energy and you know I'm a basketball player for years and so there's a lot of hook shots in this which is one of my shots in basketball. But this is called uh, Shoot the Piano Player, which is an old movie of, oh, yeah. of Truffaut's that was one of my favorite movies. And Aznavour was one of my great, you know, great Another heroes. Another Armenian. Another <laughs> Armenian is a great hero of mine. Uh -huh. And I saw that movie, the first performance in New York at the Cinema One on Fifth Avenue. And so this was a Shoot the Piano Player. And it's an old billboard that I find on uh, Hollywood Boulevard and then I take these old billboards and I what I do is I get new plywood 4x8s and I give them to these guys and I get the old billboard that oh. has old stuff on it, oh. take it, <laughs> scrape it down or add to it and, and bleed the old works that are on it, the old billboards which I used to do with our movie theater that we see, had. I can you see, I can see the, the wood through here, yeah. Right? and add stuff and subtract and so that's that's the but genesis of it but it's interesting because you have a collage it's collage process yes too and there's a, a picture of a woman with striped stockings right and it follows all the way down to the piano keys exactly <laughs> exactly great. exactly and, and then and the work boots which we were talking oh, about yeah, before right we came on the air yeah the colors 
are those influences from old world or are those influences from whatever's around you? Well, the juxtaposition of colors so that you get this, this great lime, cool colors with the very vibrant, hot yellows. And yellow is supposed to be a color that's difficult to use. Only Van Gogh was supposed to be the guy that could handle it so beautifully and did. And I don't mean to compare myself in any way. Sunflower. I the see sunflower, the sunflower the color heat, there. You yeah. Know, the heat. And so this, and pink, which is a color that uh, I guess a guy like me is not supposed to use, but I love to use it, you know? And but, I, I love pink shirts and But so you forth. do, you do collage, you work in oils, you do sculpture too. Many things, yes. The lost wax process, which I do a lot of, a lot of bronzes and, and different oh, yeah, things, yeah, yeah. and tapestries. I even paint oriental rugs, oh, which we, both of us have a great fondness for. We love that, don't yes, we? Yes. Oh, that's di those are difficult things to do. Very difficult, and but very. I looked forward to it for years, and finally I did it. But you trained yourself, basically, right? Yes. I lived with a painter originally years ago, and then one day I took one of her paintings and I began to fuss with oh. it. Has your teaching gotten better because of your artwork, do you think? I think it's affected because of the organization that's necessary to, to um. use in terms of painting and the administration of painting because you have to sort of organize it in a certain way. Then you gotta use your mind to organize it and emotionally organize painting. The same thing in teaching and in directing and in architecture each feeds the other. But to architecture, you just told me before we started that you just built two houses. You yes, actually I've, are an architect too? Well, I have a firm with a partner of mine, Leonardo Chalupowicz, and we got two lots <laughs> that I bought in Silver Lake, and from scratch we built two houses, and we sold them recently in Silver Lake. Was yeah. that more fun than any of this? A lot of fun. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of danger and a lot of fun. But a, as creative to you? Very creative to start with these hillside lots that were very oh. difficult and build these houses and then little sort of plateau mm. and then a studio behind it. It was quite wonderful, quite difficult, but wonderful. And you write? Yes, I wrote a book <laughs> called Dreams Into Action which was a bestseller and on the New York Times bestseller list. So, should we say you're a Renaissance man? Well, I don't know. I don't quite like the phrase, but uh, but I, it's so encompassing, isn't it? Maybe it goes beyond that. If you cook, we could say that it goes. I'm beyond a cook. That. I, oh, okay. but I'd like to have you over <laughs> and cook a little pasta for you. Pasta? What about Greek food? Mm, not quite so good at that. We're not doing eggplant. And <laughs> I can do an eggplant, but it's more Armenian than it is Greek. <laughs> I like that. Yes. The piece behind you is totally different. It's on board, yes. which it must be found objects. That must be what you like to do the best. But it's um, totally abstract. Right, it's abstract. It's Bukephalos, which is oh. Alexander's horse. Oh. It's a symbol of Alexander's horse. Bukephalos means uh, the head of an ox as the horse. Uh, Alexander the Great's horse uh, resembled the ox head, which had the eyes very oh. wide apart, and so the, he named it the the ox horse. Oh. And he trained that horse because nobody could ride it, and he found out that the reason was that the horse was frightened by its shadow. So he got the horse to face the sun, and in facing the sun, it didn't see its shadow. Oh, right. And then he wrote it and whispered to it. That's what he told his father and therefore trained it. So the gold is the, the gold sun. The gold was the sun. The, yeah. Right. Oh, now it, it's so abstract and I didn't know the story behind it. I know a lot of your work is in collections, London, Paris, Tokyo. Yes, uh, I had an exhibition in, uh, in Tokyo and an exhibition in Paris and collectors fortunately took stuff and their stuff in Paris and in the and, south of France. And, and New York. Yes. And I, I bet everyone who takes a class from you wants to have one of your pieces of work. That's not always true. <laughs> but 
But it's such a great <laughs> reflection of you. I think when you look at it, you see Milton Katzelis. That's very kind of you. And I thank you very much for coming on today. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. And don't go away. We'll be right back with Laura Zane. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm with director Laura Zane, who was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. She attended Ohio University, then went to the Conservatory uh, Goodman School of Drama in Chicago. You went on to work in Chicago, didn't you, after you went to school there? Yes, what were I, you doing? Um, I worked as an actor in theater. Uh, predominantly. did a little bit of film, a little bit of television, but mostly theater in Chicago. Chicago is a great theater town. I forgot you were in theater. You were acting, yes. actually. Yes. And, and theater there is like off-Broadway, isn't I mean... Yeah, they call it off-loop. Do they? <laughs> oh, yeah. same thing. Off-loop off theater, that's right. So. so you spent all that time acting? Um, I did for about six years in Chicago, and then um, I got some representation out here in L.A., and I came out here and started working in film and television out here. And so you were still acting? Yeah, in the early 80s. Yeah, up until like, or mid 80s, I should say, until the early 90s. But you don't call yourself an actor so much Well, anymore. I still act. Do you? Yeah, I do. I still act, but um, primarily I teach and direct now. And I, I started this theater company, Workshop 360, so. But you went to directing school. Mm -hmm. You yeah. went to SC and got a master's? Yes, is that I did. what it is? Yeah, I, I went back um, after working as an actor for about 10 years. I uh, started, had started directing theater, and then I thought I'd never really studied directing, so I thought I should go study that. So I went it, back. Did you need it? Um, did That's you need to study it? Because if you're being directed um, by it was somebody a good, all the time. It was a really great experience. And I have to say, uh, I really enjoyed graduate school. I highly recommend it, especially coming back to it later in life. I think I appreciated uh, uh, being at a university much more than I did when I was 19 and 20. Was it easier? Um, it was more enjoyable. It was more interesting. Let's more put it that way. Yeah, and I started teaching while I was there. and. Um, and that was and has turned out to be a wonderful occupation. So. I just started thinking about it when we were ta just now when we were talking. You came back to directing school maybe with undergraduates. Were you with undergraduate yes, I students? Yes, was. Yes. So you were older, mm -hmm. and I wondered how you got a job teaching immediately because you'd already had all this experience. Well, right. So I, <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah. So I was. I joke that my graduate degree, the two years I spent at USC in graduate acting training, was really a, a two-year job interview. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I ended up. Yeah. So I ended up applying for a job and being hired there. And then were you teaching acting, uh, directing there? Uh, at SC? Do you teach? Uh, yeah. I directing? teach acting primarily, but I also teach directing and um, a number of other courses. But and I direct at USC as well every year. So let's talk about one of the classes that you start mm -hmm. uh, that you're doing, and mm -hmm. then we'll get back to the, th yes. the workshop 360. Yes. But you started a gender studies uh, course. I did. I, I uh, well, I started a course called Sex on Stage. Uh, which, I'm sure, as you can imagine, is a very popular course. Um, because they think it's They think sex. they're going to have sex on stage. <laughs> right. um, but it's really a, a class where we focus on a writer, a playwright, who, who's dealing with issues of sexuality and gender. And we study that writer, and then we study the work, and then we get into rehearsal and we do the play. So. But, but actually, we talk about gender equality and gender work on the stage, and we're always thinking about women. But mm -hmm. gender doesn't really reply, uh, it doesn't really just affect women. Mm -hmm. It's all, it's every mm -hmm. one of us, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's male and female. Oh, absolutely. There are two genders. <laughs> Some people but think you know, there's people three. But you know, people say gender. <laughs> Right. And you think that women are underrepresented? Um, I think that certainly certain stories get told, and, and you look in the theater, you look in film and television, certain stories have a tendency to be told o more often than others, and it generally is a reflection of whoever's in charge, oh. do you know, of, of the theater company, of the network. Uh, you know, because we all kind of tend to gravitate towards the stories that re resonate for us. So if you have a lot of men in power so calling the shots, you know, deciding who's going to get the money, I don't know, right? And so I, I, I have been drawn, certainly as an artist, um, to stories maybe that haven't been told as often. 
and sometimes those stories happen to be stories about women and or, or stories where the woman is the central character or at least an interesting character you know which is the play that Christopher Durang wrote uh, Betty's Summer Vacation. Yes. Yeah, is yes. it? Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> now we've jumped very to good that. Very good segue. <laughs> um, yes, there are definitely some very interesting women in that play, that's for sure. It's not really about gender issues per se. It's a play much more about the media and about popular culture. And I think a certain uh, proclivity in our human nature to be interested in the suffering of others uh, in the form of, he really, he wrote this play after the whole um, L Lorena Bobbitt case and uh, the Men Menendez brothers and he was just very struck, it was kind of the beginning of those big court cases becoming, you know. How uh, old is Christopher Durant? He's probably, I would say, well I don't want to give his know, age 40s, away, but I would 50s, say 40s, I would say 40s. 40s. So he is writing about pop popular culture mm -hmm. and using um, I guess what both men and women in his yeah there are both men and women in his plays. Yeah, I mean definitely. as centerpieces. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, yeah. what drew you to this? Um, I think I'm very interested in Christopher Drang as a satirist. You know, he's a um. his plays are highly farcical in nature, and I find that that form to be very challenging for actors and directors. In the it theater. seems like it's easy. That kind of really. To me, it seems like satire would be e uh, easy to, to act or direct, but uh -huh. maybe there's this nuance that we don't know. I think it's, don't it's don't challenging know. to do it really well. I That's think it's often done with lots of energy and good intentions, but I don't know if, if it really, because I think we miss sometimes the depth. You know, uh -huh. they call it dark comedy for a reason, and, and the darkness, the underbelly of the experience, which I think is often lacking. And you that's know? what we don't see. We see this kind of light. Yeah, it's like, I'm funny. I'm a funny character. Yeah, I'm you wacky. Don't know we don't really see why, why these people are insane. I mean, his, or his why they're plays covering are covering what exactly they're... Exactly, what they're covering. That's right. And his people really, in his plays, often he writes a lot. I'm very drawn to his, in a lot of his plays, it seems to me, he has these families where there's lots of mis, missed, not just miscommunication, but just people really operating on completely different, rea you know, from different realities and really living in a lot of denial and, um, you know, not hearing each other at all, not wanting to hear each other. And I think there's a, you know, he's interested in that aspect of what is really rather abusive sometimes in families, I think. Why would that play or his place be so specifically good for LA? It's never played here. You're hmm. premiering it, aren't you? It is an LA premiere and, and <laughs> I'm not sure, I'm not sure why. I think the rights weren't available for a while. I think they were trying to get something kind of big scale going on and we were very persistent. Um, the managing director of our company, Tasha Ames and I both uh, had written to Durang and written to his agents and I actually have been in contact with him and have since talked to him on the phone. You spoke to him. What yeah. did he say about this? Did he give you any kind of directions? Uh, he, yes, he, <laughs> yes. He had a lot of suggestions, really valuable suggestions about the play and he had a lot of questions about our company. You know, we're, we're a relatively young company, small company, and he didn't really know about us, too, didn't know much about us, so he wanted to know about us. And um, my hope is that by the end of the conversation, I think he felt his play was in good hands. And, Will he come um, to see it? He's very busy right now. He has a new play, actually two new plays happening on the East Coast right now. I think one's in, um, one's definitely in New York at Playwrights Horizons, and I'm not sure where the other one is, Boston, I believe. So are we <laughs> talking about Workshop 360? Yes. Doing this play? Yes, Workshop 360. I see. Yeah, it's a company. And so Workshop, you just call it Workshop, but it's really a theater company? Yeah, it's called Workshop 360. That's the name of the theater company that I started. And where, does it, where do you um, perform? Uh, we perform, we alternate spaces. We don't have our own space, um, but we mostly perform on the west side and mostly in Venice at the Electric Lodge is um. where our next show will be in October. And do you teach there? No, I don't teach there. At sorry. Workshop 360, no, do I they don't. learn? Do, do, no, do I only teach it at USC. That's kind of my day job. But, but what happens to the people who are a part of the, the, um, oh, the say, company. the workshop, the company? Mm -hmm. Well, the company is comprised of people, actually some former students of mine uh -huh. who've since graduated, and, and then colleagues of mine that I've worked with um, uh, in other places in Los Angeles, so I think we're pretty much like-minded in terms of our aesthetic and so forth. Did you audition them to come and be a part of it? No. How do you become a part of, the, um, of our members are all uh, by invitation? They've it's been invited. by invitation. Yeah. yeah. So you know because you've taught these people or you've worked with them that they have yes. the same ideas. Yes. And what are those ideas? 
Um, <laughs> in a nutshell. Well, I think that we're all very much committed to theater as an art form and to the work of the actor as an art form as opposed to um, just an opportunity to kind of showcase ourselves in this town. Uh. I think not that that's not obviously something that's nice to do as well, but I think we're really um, focused on the work of the actor as an opportunity to really transform ourselves, if that sounds a bit lofty, but it's true that the work is really, we take the work pretty seriously. And um, I think, um, and we're interested in material that really is saying something about the world that we live in, we hope. And certainly some, so, so that we're somehow really educated and informed by what we do. And you're teaching your audience something too? Maybe, certainly or sharing want, something yeah. about what we're learning about. We have a project that's coming up, for instance, for next year that I started working on with um, a writer named Bridget Mullins who teaches out in uh, uh, Harvard and Brown and is a wonderful playwright. And she and I are in the beginning of working on a new project about the American West. And we're starting at the very beginning. And kind of looking at the whole history of the American West as a way of understanding uh, our identity as Americans and kind of as we look at what's happening in the world today, what is this assumption we have that we have the best, you know, of democracy right. of that, you know, yeah. and we're going to go out and, you know, that we're uh, in charge of showing people what freedom really is. And we're just kind of curious about some of those Issues. That, that's so. great. I mean, I think you really did put it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. And I thank you. Yes. Thanks, Zane. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for having me. And thanks it. for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles today. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, Los Angeles, 90017, 44th floor. See you next time. Profiles.